welcome to the Human Flourishing Project. I'm your host, Alex Epstein. Okay, last week I began part one of a series on a writer that I talked about being really infatuated with and whom I thought had a lot of wisdom about the world. And last week I talked about the wisdom of ridicule that this person has. Now, I still stand by all of this, but I can see how some of that message was undercut by the fact that I got the person's name wrong. I continually referred to Arthur Bennett, and I posted on Facebook referencing Arthur Bennett, and I sent out an email referencing Arthur Bennett, and I talked on the podcast about Arthur Bennett, and then uh, some of you kindly pointed out to me that the man in question's name is Arnold Bennett. So this is the wisdom of Arnold Bennett, part two. Sorry about that last week. I've done this kind of thing at least once before. I remember once I was writing an article and there was a guy named um, Burton Folsom. And I think I just kept spelling his name wrong over and over and over and over. I think it was F. I think it's F-O-L-S-O-M, and I spelled it F-U-L-S-O-M. Of course, I'd be getting that wrong. And then at one point, the editor just thought, like, what, what are you doing? You're just mentioning this guy's name. You're just getting it wrong. So I, I don't know. I can't plead anything except that I guess I saw Bennett's name once or twice, and then I just got immersed in the work, and then I just looked at it on my Kindle and jumped in. Maybe it's that. Um, maybe it's that just because I read so much digitally, it just, um, I don't see the cover of books as much as you would physically. But in any case, we're talking this week about the wisdom of Arnold Bennett. And last week I talked about how how much value I think there is from what I call his his wise ridicule, which is that he points out very common patterns in human behavior that I think just about all of us can recognize in ourselves to some degree and he makes them seem ridiculous, and they are ridiculous in the sense of worthy of ridicule, in the sense of being things that we shouldn't want to do or want to do nearly as much as, as we can. And I found that incredibly valuable. And, and specifically, I mentioned he talked about just how time is wasted and not not valued, and then also how much we focus on negative things about others. So check that out and just substitute in your mind whenever I say Arthur, say Arnold, because that is correct. So this week I want to talk about some of his what I'll call positive ideas, and I'll see how many I can get through. I think I want to have another one next week, or at least in some future week, about what I call real talk, which is too cute a term, and in a sense too modern a term, but one thing I really like about Bennett is that he's not afraid to talk about areas of life that people are uncomfortable with and then uncomfortable truths about those areas of life. So last week we talked about, I, I covered some of those, but I, I think I want to cover some of those next week. And, and it might be, in a sense, the most controversial episode of this podcast. And it won't always be cases where I agree with him or disagree with him or even know, but where I think he's raising issues with things like how people approach money, how people approach success, what kinds of impressions we make on people, how we how we approach the past, and even how we approach marriage. Not that I have any personal experience, but I'm very interested in how he talks about it. So that's that's coming next week. This week is, I think next week, at least a coming week. This week, though, I'm going to cover a couple of issues where I'm very confident that he's essentially right because I've used similar approaches myself with a lot of success and just thought about the issue. And then I'm going to share a couple of issues where I'm very intrigued by his perspective, where I'm not sure to what extent he's right, but at least for me, I think it's really worth exploring. So the first thing I'll, I'll cover is a kind of small issue, but it's one of those issues that's, that's simple, but not necessarily easy to execute, and that in, in any case has huge benefits to getting right. And this is 
his discussion of personal finance, which, if you follow the show, I have been focused on that myself this year from more the perspective of long-term planning, and I'll probably have an update about that soon since I've been making some good progress in terms of getting advisors and improving my practices. But here in particular, what he's talking about is the phenomenon of spending less than you make and just how important that is and how little done it is and then and how much suffering that creates. And I think there's an analogy with time, which I may get into. Analogy to time, I should say. So here's what he talks he talks about overspending. 90 or should I say 99% of all those anxieties which render proper living almost impossible are caused by the habit of walking on the edge of one's income as one might walk on the edge of a precipice. So just to interject as Alex, just I love the way he writes. Edge of one's income as one might walk on the edge of a precipice. Then he says, speaking generally, a man can contrive out of, extre- out of an extremely modest income to have all that he needs, unless he needs the esteem of snobs. Now, I don't, I don't agree with that myself, but there's something to that. And he says, the, I suppose that for the majority of men, the suspension of income for a single month would mean either bankruptcy, the usurer, as in taking a loan, or acute inconvenience. Impossible under such circumstances to be in full and independent possession of one's immortal soul. Hence, I should be inclined to say that the first preliminary to a proper control of the machine, he means the human brain, is the habit of spending decidedly less than one earns or receives. It would be as reasonable to expect the inhabitants of an unfortified city in the midst of a plain occupied by a hostile army to apply themselves successfully to the study of logarithms or metaphysics as to expect a man without a year's income in his safe to apply himself successfully to the true art of living. That is really, really powerful. At least I, I find it that way. Because he, he's giving this this visual of we're, we're standing on the edge of our income like on the edge of a precipice. So it's just always by just by just barely getting by on our income, just spending as much as we make, or today spending more than we make, then we're just, we're always, we're on edge in many senses, and it has to have an emotional consequence, and it has to limit our behavior. And yet, and there are fairly straightforward ways of just spending less than we make, considerably less, but it's a real habit to develop. It takes discipline, because otherwise, it's just like, oh, I get an allowance as a kid, and I'm just going to spend all of it, or you know, maybe I'll save it up for a specific thing, but it's always just thinking about, okay, well, I, I, at least I'll give my own experience, just, hey, I want stuff, and so how much can I afford? But of course, when we're kids, we have parents supporting us as our long-range primary form of support and also backup if something goes wrong. So it's, I just thought this is so true that being comfortable financially and not having that worry is just incredibly liberating and that it meeting that need makes possible a whole bunch of other needs. But if we're just wondering where our next meal is going to come from, or not even that, but just wondering how we're going to pay all our bills and we know that, oh, if I lost my job or if I quit my job in a month, I'd be in big trouble, that just totally, totally changes things. And I remember last year, um, there was a one point at which my company, we were spending more than we were taking in, making certain kinds of investments. And I think I talked about this on the podcast where it just, it wasn't, it wasn't necessary to do that. Maybe I did, maybe I didn't. I forget uh, exactly what I talk about on the podcast and what I talk about just to my friends, but it was just notable to me. Oh, wow. When I, when I decided to make a big investment, I didn't appreciate the extent to which this investment by temporarily spending more than I was than the company was making by a significant margin, that could that could put us under financial pressure. And then that would dramatically affect life because then then life has to be focused on just making money, making changes, versus if we're always comfortable and then we do experiments, but experiments within our means that are not bet the company experiments, then we can always be comfortable and relaxed. And I think there's a certain parallel with time here. I think a lot about the issue of 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 just 
having time be too rushed and too much urgency. Now, I really like making the most of time, but there's a sense in which if I'm just always on the verge of being late or I just feel like I have enough time to do things, that's the kind of stress where things can explode more easily, but also where it's hard to be relaxed and what I would call high altitude when I'm just always feeling like I'm filling up my time with just as many possible commitments as I can. And today I was noticing I was taking a walk in the afternoon and I felt like I'd managed my week well. And there were certain things that I could do, but nothing I really felt like I had to do. And I, I was able to think well. And also it was fun to think about, hey, maybe I'll do this. Hey, maybe I'll do that. But there wasn't that kind of or th that kind of necessity of, oh, I got to do this and I'm just overloaded or I'm kind of at, I'm barely on top of things. So one, one person once put it to me as you're, you know, are you kind of buried under your commitments or are you surfing on top of them? And I like the idea of surfing on top of them. And I think with money and with certainly with money and probably with time, there's a lot we can benefit from the, the perspective that Bennett is conveying so eloquently. Now, I should say I, I, I indicated I disagree with what he talks about, you know, out of an extremely modest income, you can have all you need. I think that's fundamentally there's something there that you definitely don't want to spend on things that are that aren't actually going to get you results. And I think we'll have some more quotes from him about how people do that with their time and with their money. But if we if we really think of the key thing in our life as time and then we want the option of doing with that time the thing that will be most fulfilling to us, then money is incredibly powerful. And I find that that's the things I spend my time, my money on are things where I can make more out of the time. So even something like if I'm if I can fly first class flight, that used to seem like a total waste. But, and it's often included when I when I do speaking, so I got used to it that way, but I can do a lot more on a first-class flight, and that might be four hours, five hours across the country. I can get more work done. I can be more relaxed. That's a really big deal. That's, a, in my view, if, if one can afford it, a good use of money. And in terms of productivity, it can actually make you money if you know how to make a bunch of money with extra thinking time. Or I'm a big, I don't even drive. I ride Uber all the time. And that's another thing where, yeah, that costs money. But that makes me more productive. And then living in a certain environment, yeah, that that increases the quality of all of the time. And these are these are things where, yeah, you gotta gotta make a decent amount of money to do some of these things. Uh, hopefully, in the future, at least with some of them, technology will allow them to be more and more accessible. So flying will be more comfortable for everyone, and hopefully, we'll have auto enough automation with travel where everyone can in effect have a, a super, super safe automated Uber driver. But th these are just examples where there's this art of using money to maximize the quality and quantity of time. And sometimes when people talk about, oh, you don't need much money, they are neglecting that. Okay, number two. Let's see, where does he talk about this? This, this may be my favorite thing that of Bennett's in terms of what resonated with me personally most in terms of how I think about life and what I find enjoyable about life. And I would, the, the current way I would put it is love of cause and effect. So here's, here's some of the quotes related to this. Art is a great thing, but it is not the greatest the most important of all perceptions is the continual perception of cause and effect. In other words, the perception of the continuous development of the universe, in still other words, the perception of the course of evolution. When one has thoroughly got imbued in one's head the leading truth that nothing happens without a cause, one grows not only large-minded, but large-hearted." One loses in the study of cause and effect that absurd air which so many people have of being always shocked and pained by the curiousness of life. The study of cause and effect, while it lessens the painfulness of life, adds to life's picturesqueness. The man who is imbued with the idea of development, of continuous cause and effect, 
perceives in the sea an element which in the day before yesterday of geology was vapor, which yesterday was boiling, and which tomorrow will inevitably be ice. And, my dear sir, perhaps you happen to be an estate agent's clerk, and you hate the arts, and you want to foster your, your immortal soul, and you can't be interested in your business because it's so humdrum. Nothing is humdrum. So I... I now, he, this has a focus. There's there's kind of a dual focus here, and, and, and part of it I really like, and then part of it I think has merit, but it's it's not the part I'm in love with. So the part I think has merit that I'm not in love with is he's talking about, in part, understanding cause and effect in the sense of understanding the deterministic elements of other people, or at least understanding the elements of other people that are outside our control and that have different kinds of causes, even if people do have free will. And he does... Uh, believe in, and I would say recognize free will, because I consider myself to recognize uh, free will as just a fact of how human nature works, which is a whole big subject that some of you might think is controversial, and it is, I guess, controversial, but that, that just, just to give you a sense of his view and, incidentally, my view on that subject. So he does recognize or believe in in choice, but then he recognizes that that has a context of the, the choice isn't just a random kind of thing, that there are all of these different influences, environmental influences, genetic influences, just all, all kinds of, of influences where when people act a certain way, it's not just random and it's it's not just, oh, it's it's beneficent or maleficent in the sense of, oh, they're just they're just from zero trying to screw me or they're trying to be great to me. There's there's really a lot going on, and understanding that is useful, and understanding the limits of our own control of that is useful. And the more that we, often when we take other people as as entities that we cannot change, that can lead to a lot of benefits, because then we're going to try to find the entities that are really aligned with us from the get-go, and then maybe occasionally see if we can do anything to make them even more aligned, but but not try to devote ourselves to wholesale changing other people because that that is often contrary to their nature and can have a very low probability of success and besides as as I talked about last week and quoting him we got plenty of issues ourselves where we don't want to uh, get focused on other people's issues too much so that's the sense in which it's interesting but not that I love it. But the thing I love, which gets captured by this thing at the end where he says nothing is humdrum, and when he talks about the continual perception of cause and effect, this this I really relate to. And and I think of it as just finding finding life fascinating, but in particular finding finding cause and effect fascinating and just seeing the world and wanting to understand how it works and then wanting to leverage that understanding into different capabilities. So what just a small a small kind of example that is that may devalue this whole thing, but I was just thinking of it with um, right before the show with my assistant Kelso, who produces this show. We got recently some uh, we've been thinking about how to improve the Wi-Fi in the work area because the the general Wi-Fi, uh, router has not been that good and it doesn't go into all the rooms and that makes it less reliable and whatnot. And so we got one solution and then it wasn't working very well and it was fun for me to think about, okay, why isn't this working? And then we recently got some Google Pucks, which are working better. But then I'm I'm trying to understand, okay, how do these work and how can we make them even better? Like where should we put them? What should be the distancing? And it's just really satisfying to under to try to understand the physics of what's going on with these pucks and how they interact with each other, how they interact with the wall. The pucks, I should say, they're they're ways of extending your Wi-Fi. And then when I think of that, it's just there's a certain satisfaction in being able to understand the world. And then I can imp- I can try placing the pucks differently, and then I can see how that works, and then see if I was right. And so much of life is that is that kind of thing where we want to we want to be more and more capable in life in different kinds of ways and get get more and more in control of the results and and have results that we'll be happier and happier with and then that requires understanding the way the world works so that we can enact certain causes to get certain effects and then 
once one is on the premise of just looking for cause and effect, life becomes very interesting because we always want to know, okay, why is this happening? How does this, how does this really work? What can I do with that knowledge? And that, and I, and I find that with this attitude, I can become anyone I meet can become really interesting because I, I at least can find out what they do, but not in the sense of, hey, what do you do? And am I impressed by that? Are you impressed by what I do? But usually they're, they're working in some area that they have some specific expertise and I don't understand the way that that world works. I, I, I haven't, haven't been at a, a kind of boring social event in a while where I would, I would in particular do this, just trying to find uh, something, but I just remember when I was a kid, I'd talk to somebody who was in the uh, arcade business and just wanting. Now that I guess was a very kid-friendly business, but just wanting to understand how that worked, or even even somebody. You know, I shouldn't even say even, but people in in construction who are doing janitorial things. I mean, certainly with Uber drivers, I don't talk to Uber drivers that much, but at the beginning, I would really become fascinated by just how does this world work? And and that is just a fascinating thing. One expression that I've, I've used myself, I'm sure it's not original, is that interesting people are interested people. So interesting people are interested people. So people who are interested in life are interesting. And people who are interested in life, what does it mean to be interested in life? Really, it means to understand life, and life operates, everything operates by cause and effect. So it's really understanding the specifics of cause and effect. That is a fascinating thing and an empowering thing. So I loved this kind of perspective that Bennett brings to things. Okay, next I want to talk about a couple of issues where I'm... Not sure. Definitely, these I don't consider these are things where I have validated these on my own, but these are the things that he, that Bennett is talking about that are kind of on my mind, thinking about, and it, it seems like, wow, he's got a lot of wisdom here, and I could certainly improve in these areas. So one is going to be control of one's brain. He's got a huge emphasis on that. And then the other is a proper focus on the present, which I'm particularly interested in and sometimes haunted by when I, when I read him. So I'll do control of the brain first. And this may be the biggest positive theme of his work. It's certainly all over how to live on 24 hours per day, and it's all over the human machine. So here's a quote, and this is actually from a reader but he agrees with it, and it's really good. The reader is an Oxford lecturer, so I guess somebody who lex- lectured at Oxford University. Here's the quote. Till a man has got his physical brain completely under his control, suppressing its too great receptivity, its tendencies to reproduce idly the thoughts of others, and to be swayed by every passing gust of emotion, I hold that he cannot do a tenth part of the work that he would then be able to perform with little or no effort. Moreover, work apart, he has not entered upon his kingdom and unlimited possibilities of future development are barred to him. So before I go into that, I will read a little bit more, going to a different part of my notes here. Here we go. This is Bennett. People say one can't help one's thoughts, but one can. The control of the thinking machine is perfectly possible. And since nothing whatever happens to us outside our own brain, since nothing hurts us or gives us pleasure except within the brain, the supreme importance of being able to control what goes on in that mysterious brain is patent. And he goes on, And without the power to concentrate, that is to say, without the power to dictate to the brain its task and to ensure obedience, true life is impossible. Mind control is the first element of a full existence. Another passage, the first business of the day should be to put the mind through its paces. You look after your body inside and out. You run grave danger in hacking hairs off your skin. You employ a whole army of individuals, from the milkman to the pig killer, to enable you to bribe your stomach into decent behavior. Why not devote a little attention to the far more delicate machinery of the mind, especially as you will require no extraneous aid? 
It is for this portion of the art and craft of living that I have reserved the time from the moment of quitting your door to the moment of arriving at your office. When you leave your house, concentrate your mind on a subject, no matter what, to begin with. You will not have gone ten yards before your mind has skipped away under your very eyes and is larking round the corner with another subject. Bring it back by the scruff of the neck. Ere you have reached the station, you will have brought it back about forty times. Do not despair. Continue. Keep it up. You will succeed. You cannot by any chance fail if you persevere. By the regular practice of concentration, as to which there is no secret, save the secret of perseverance, you can tyrannize over your mind, which is not the highest part of you, every hour of the day, and in no matter what place. The exercise is a very convenient one. Get your mind in hand, and see how the process cures half the evils of life, especially worry, that miserable, avoidable, shameful disease, worry. And I'll just read another set of passages, and then I'll say a few things about that, about all of them. Oh, you know what? Never mind. The other passage I was looking for was just a, a repeat highlight of the uh, Oxford lecturer. But I'll, I'll read that one more time because it's, it's really good. Till a man has got his physical brain completely under his control, suppressing its too great receptivity, its tendencies to reproduce idly the thoughts of others, and to be swayed by every passing gust of emotion, I hold that he cannot do a tenth part of the work that he would then be able to perform with little or no effort. So this is a really interesting issue. And in general, thinking about how to deal with what I would call one's subconscious, which is, I believe, driver of emotions. But, and if you believe emotions are very connected to thoughts, which I do, you think of it as, which that is a whole big issue, by the way. I shouldn't oversimplify that, and there are a bunch of different dynamics there. But in general, we have the experience of we have different kinds of emotions, and then we have different kinds of thoughts, and then they're kind of often passing through us and there's a question of what to do with them. And there's certainly a kind of wisdom that we don't want to ignore them or suppress them or repress them in an unhealthy way. But then there's a question of what is an unhealthy way. And then there's also the phenomenon of just getting, of being completely the slave of emotions. And then if emotions are subconscious thoughts, then we just create a game where kind of any random negative thought can just completely derail us and control our future. So I don't, I don't, I'm not going to resolve all of that today, but it's, there, there's a lot to this idea that we want our mind, I mean, if, we, if we want to flourish, which is, which is in part a certain experience of life, we, need to, we, want, we want our brain to to act in a way that benefits us, a lot of which is concentrating on specific things that are productive and or enjoyable. So certainly in work, when I'm trying to get something done, if I'm worrying about a whole bunch of things or if I'm just having random thoughts or uh, a whole bunch of intrusive anxiety or I'm worried, I'm concerned about something with other people, that is, or or just my mind is going all over the place on all sorts of subjects, that is not helping me achieve my goal, and it's generally not an enjoyable state. So that is just, and, and in general, probably people's minds are just too much run by their subconscious and not really aware of of what's happening. And so the key is, I think, how do we use our subconscious so that we, we want to be aware of what's going on so that occasionally or often maybe it'll be telling us something important and we don't want to ignore that. Or if something is repetitively coming up, we don't want to ignore that. And there are different ways of dealing with those kinds of thoughts and emotions. But in general, it's a very, very desirable thing to be in control of one's brain, at least in a broad directional sense. And here I'm intrigued by Bennett's exercise of just trying to focus on something, concentrate on something for 15 minutes or 30 minutes, and then to feel oneself get torn from it, and then to keep coming back and to develop that muscle. 
Now, my my own cheating thing that I do with this that I've mentioned on a previous episode and, and that I've been doing even more since I started talking about it is I walk around a lot. I think a lot while walking, but I stay on task by talking out loud. So I just talk all the time out loud and I just act like I'm talking to somebody on the phone. And in fact, what I'm doing is I'm recording it on Otter, which is this app that I love, and then Otter transcribes it quite well. And then later, if I say anything good, I can very just quickly scan Otter, and it does a good enough transcription where I can just find stuff. And then that that combines the greater creativity I usually find from talking, particularly if I'm relaxed and I don't feel like I have to take notes, but then I can I can take that and I can synthesize or mine from it or just throw a whole bunch of it away if it wasn't good. So I find that, and then also, by the way, I like, with that, I love working with handwriting, particularly on the iPad. There's just, there's something about that where for organizing thinking and for condensing thinking and condensing and organizing thinking at the same time, there's just nothing like that. So I really like the open, I really like to think in an open-ended way while talking and then to condense and organize with pen and paper, but particularly the iPad, because you can just do so many, you can just manipulate things so much more easily, like move things around and change colors and and all kinds of stuff. So that's a sort of digression, but I've become intrigued. So I don't feel like I have much of an issue. I'm certainly able to concentrate on a subject for a long period of time, whether I'm working on it. I, I guess I've practiced this a lot in my work. So I can I can certainly focus on writing or anything else for a long period of time and enjoy it. And but I am interested in this for myself, this skill of just thinking in my head and without without the benefit of speaking out loud or without the benefit of writing down. Can I just think about something in my head for 15 minutes for 30 minutes and be in control of it. And that, that seems like it'll be a valuable exercise. So it's something that I think is worth trying. And uh, I will be interested if any of you try it to see what you think. Okay, final topic. that, And this is the one that I think about most with Bennett is his view of the present. And how do we the relationship between thinking about the present, thinking about the future, this is a general kind of thing which we hear a lot of ideas about. You know, you got to live in the present, live in the now. But I, I like how he, I, I'm intrigued by how he thinks about it. I'll just say that. And so I'll read some of his quotes and then give a couple of reflections. Okay, the first, oh, yeah, I just got the page totally wrong. So here he talks about the, the positive experience of the person who's focused on what he calls the human machine, the brain, and in particular, also who em- who employs the kind of focus on concentration that is throughout Bennett's work, at least his nonfiction work that I've read. In due season, the man whose hobby is his brain will gradually settle down into a daily routine, with which routine he will start the day. The idea at the back of the mind of the ordinary man by the ordinary man, I mean the man whose brain is not his hobby, is almost always this. There are several things at present hanging over me. Worries, unfulfilled ambitions, unrealized desires. As soon as these things are definitely settled, then I shall begin to live and enjoy myself. That is the ordinary man's usual idea. He has it from his youth to his old age. He is invariably waiting for something to happen before he really begins to live. I am sure that if you are an ordinary man, of course you aren't, I know, you will admit that this is true of you. You exist in the hope that one day things will be sufficiently smoothed out for you to begin to live. That is just where you differ from the man whose brain is his hobby. His daily routine consists in a meditation in the following vein. This day is before me. The circumstances of this day are my environment. They are the material out of which, by means of my brain, I have to live and be happy and to refrain from causing unhappiness in other people. It is the business of my brain to make use of this material. My brain is in its box for that sole purpose. Not tomorrow. Not next year. Not when I have made my fortune. Not when my sick child is out of danger. Not when my wife has returned to her senses. Not when my salary is raised. Not when I have passed that examination. Not when my indigestion is better. But now. Today. Exactly as today is. The facts of today which in my unregeneracy I regarded primarily as anxieties, nuisances, impediments, 
I now regard as so much raw material from which my brain has to weave a tissue of life that is comely, comely being beautiful, or at least attractive. And to get uh, some more on this, and then he foresees the day as well as he can. His experience teaches him that he will have difficulty, and he administers to his brain the lessons of which it will have the most need. He carefully looks the machine over and arranges it, specially for the sort of road which he knows that it will have to traverse. The man who can, the man who commences his day by a steady contemplation of the dangers which the next 16 hours are likely to furnish, and by arming himself specially against those dangers, has thereby armed himself, though to a less extent, against dangers which he did not dream of. And uh, I can't resist quoting this. I seem to hear you saying, and a fine egotist he'll be. Well, he'll be the right sort of egotist. The average man is not half enough of an egotist. If egotism means a terrific interest in oneself, egotism is ab- absolutely essential to efficient living. There's no getting away from that. So, fellow lovers of Ayn Rand, you can probably particularly appreciate that. Okay, I want to, before I comment on that, I'm going to read the next section where he's link. So he's talking, this is, I just talk about this general idea of living in the present but then also we have this idea of th- there's we're going to be talking about, or he's going to be talking rather about the relationship between this and ambition so here's another set of quotes he's, he's this is in the context of him talking about environment but then the the most important environment being the in, the internal environment created by one's purpose or purposes so here's the, here's some of the quotes There is the environment of one's general purpose in life, which is, I feel convinced, far more often hopelessly wrong and futile than either the environment of situation or the environment of individuals. This is a matter of daily observation, that people are frantically engaged in attempting to get a hold of things by which, by, sorry, which by universal experience are hideously disappointing to those who have obtained possession of them. I will be bold enough to say that quite 70% of ambition is never realized at all, and that 99% of all realized ambition is fruitless. A man whose first business it is every day to concentrate his mind on the proper performance of that particular day must necessarily conserve his interest in the present. If an ambition survives and flourishes on the top of that daily cultivation of the machine— then the owner of the ambition may be sure that it is a genuine and an invincible ambition, and he may pursue it in full faith. His developed care for the present will prevent him from making his ambition an altar on which the whole of the present is to be offered up. When I say that current ambitions usually result in disappointment, that they usually mean the complete distortion of a life. Or, sorry, what I say. What I say is that the is that current ambitions usually result in disappointment, that they usually mean the complete distortion of a life. This is an incontestable fact, and the reason of it is that ambitions are chosen either without knowledge of their real value or without knowledge of what they will cost. Then another section that's relevant, it will also convince its possessor that the ambition to live strictly according to the highest common sense during the next 24 hours is an ambition that needs a lot of beating in the sense that it's, that's a good core ambition to have. So I'm going to read the, the final section with these quotes, and then I'll, I'll say things, but I hope that you're at least finding this intriguing, because I definitely find it intriguing and challenging, particularly as somebody who considers himself quite ambitious and who certainly thinks a lot about the future. Beware of hope and beware of ambition. Each is excellently tonic, like German competition, in moderation. Existence rightly considered is a fair compromise between two instincts, the instinct of hoping one day to live and the instinct to live here and now. That, that I think, is a powerful statement. Existence rightly considered is a fair compromise between two instincts, the instinct of hoping one, one, of hoping one day to live and the instinct to live here and now. Another one. Prepare to live by all means, but for heaven's sake, do not forget to live. You will never have a better chance than you have at present. Surely you are not so naive as to imagine that that the road on the other side of that hill there is more beautiful than the piece you are now traversing. Another one. Hopes are never realized, 
for in the act of realization they become something else. Ambitions may be attained, but ambitions attained are rather like burnt coal. 90% of the heat generated has gone up the chimney instead of into the room. Another one. This way that you are, this that you are living now is life itself. It is much more life itself than that which you will be living 20 years hence. Grasp that truth. Dwell on it. Absorb it. Let it influence your conduct to the end that neither the present nor the future be neglected. The folly of neglecting to savor the present, the folly of assuming that the future can be essentially different from the present, the fatuity or fatuity of dying before they have begun to live. So as I said, I find this very, this is a very kind, this is a very compelling kind of challenge because there, there's definitely something to it, which is that it's, it's very easy to be focused on the future and to justify everything in terms of the future. And then there's a question, okay, what, what are my expectations about what the future will be like and are they realistic at all? So am I saying, well, I'm going to suffer now, but in the future, my life is going to be blissful. And even what is that going to mean? So am I just working to make a lot a, a kind of cliche and and caricature version of this is, oh, I'm just I'm just working to I don't enjoy what I'm doing, but I want to retire in old age and have comfort then and then I'm going to go to Florida and whatnot. And Warren Buffett has a has a criticism of this that's or something related, which he says that that doing work you don't enjoy for in you know in the name of making money for later is like saving sex for old age like no you want to enjoy yourself you want to work you want to you want to find work that you really really enjoy so i think it's a really good challenge it's a good challenge to certain people to say okay if you think you're enjoying the present what about the future? That is a good kind of challenge. I think often people who are kind of just in the present or think of themselves that way aren't even enjoying the present as much as one can enjoy the present. But certainly those of us who are very focused on the future and goals, it's a good kind of question to ask us, what is, okay, are you really enjoying the present? And the, the best way so far I know how to think about this is to just be very, is to think of life very much as a process or an experience and to think of what kind of process do I want and then how will goal pursuit be a good part of that process? How can goal pursuit be a good part of that process? So it's not that, well, when I finish my new book, I'm going to finish that. And then when I finish that, everything will be easy. And because first of all, like, do I want everything to be easy? No, obviously I want challenge in my life maybe not obviously but i what i do that's that's a lot of the fun of the life uh, fun in life and for me particularly is just understanding cause and effect in new ways and having theories and testing out the theories and seeing if they work that's really fun so that's the kind of thing that i always want to be able to do so then i think of i want to set goals in a way where my life is going to be as enjoyable a process as possible for as long as possible, and then, but then that that imposes a lot of standards on things. So I, I don't want to work now in a way where I'm just feeling overwhelmed all the time. Because if I do that, then I'm probably going to be doing that in the future. Because there's always going to be something new, and that's a good thing. It's a good thing there's always something new. But I, I want to approach those new things with enjoyment and with what I sometimes call relaxed productivity. I want that process to be enjoyable. So when I think about a goal, a lot of what I want to think about is what is what will the process of that goal be like? And if it seems like it's one of those things where it's just suffering, 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 and then I've gotten this goal and then I don't know what to do with myself and then I need another goal and it's just going to be the suffering, 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 and then this brief kind of orgasm of the goal and that's it, there's something... There's something very off there. So my, I, I'm really interested what other people think of, of all of this, but I find it just very helpful to think of what what kind of process do I want my life to be like and then and then planning accordingly. 
But then even within there, the thing that I'm I'm most intrigued by here that I I'm just starting to think about is what what are the implications of this for the day to day thinking about life? Because I I have talked about on this show, episode three, I believe, how I'm a really big fan of celebrating progress, appreciating progress. I do this exercise just about every day, sometimes multiple times a day, called the positive focus, which I got from Dan Sullivan of Strategic Coach, where I'm talking, I talk about, oh, well, I, I achieved this. And then I think about here's why this was valuable or important to me. And then here's how I can make further progress long term. And then here's my very next action. And that is a very satisfying kind of thing because I, I, I can just see my growth and I can appreciate it. But then what's the relationship between that and enjoying the day? Is there more that I could do to enjoy the process of the day? What is that like? And, and I'm not exactly sure of all these. I'm sure there is more that I could do to enjoy the day. But even within the day when I'm celebrating the day, is it too much just focused on these little milestones? Or or should I just appreciate more the things that I just the the experience of think just a little bit more about the experience of doing these things, particularly if I get to work on a really interesting problem, just think about, oh yeah, I really enjoyed that. That was a really fun thing to do. Or I like doing this particular interview and then just getting an idea of that. So any thoughts that anyone has on this would love to hear them. And th- th- there are a bunch more, there's a lot more of Bennett. So highly recommend checking him out. I've, I've read a bunch of my favorite passages next week or, or some s- week soon. I want to talk about his real talk. So the, the issues where he's really challenging a lot of conventional areas of life. And he's, he, he reminds me of a comedian in the sense of there, there's some expression to the effect of normally people only talk about 25% of life and the other 75% only comedians talk about. And there's a lot of truth to that. For example, it's it's a cliche that comedians talk about relationships and why do they do that? But in part, people, I think, do not often talk honestly about relationships or about their challenges uh, in relationships. And some of this is speculative because I'm thinking about, it. well, what is it like to be married? And I've never been married. What is, what is that like? What is that actually like? And are people willing to talk about it or are they afraid to talk about it. in what contexts are they they talk about the the benefits and the hazards and regrets and things they're happy with and what comedians are they can kind of talk about anything so they 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 tap into things that we're uncomfortable talking about and i like that bennett talks about these things but in a much more direct and systematic way and i'm i'm eager to l- learn just other people who talk about this stuff Another group of people who talk about this stuff in a real way, interestingly, are psychologists, if you can find a good one. And certainly when I've seen psychologists, I feel like a lot of insight I've gotten out of life is them just saying, oh, yeah, well, this is this is how these things usually work versus how people present them. And maybe one one expression that's related to this is the expression, never compare your inside. I think it's never compare your inside to somebody else's outside. And the idea is, well, we, we only see other people's outsides most of the time, and we don't always know what's going on with them. And then psychologists, they're the people who are exposed to the inside in many, many ways. And Ben, it seems like somebody who, for a number of different reasons, has really is really aware of what people's inner lives are like, and he has a lot of insight about that and, and a lot of ideas about how to improve those lives. So I'm interested in that. Hope you enjoyed. I really hope I did not call him Arthur Bennett again today. I forget, but I hope you enjoyed this second discussion of Arnold Bennett, particularly his some of his positive ideas, some of his sage wisdom, and then some of the the stuff that may be wisdom that I'm exploring. Next week, I will be back talking probably about real talk, but otherwise talking about something valuable, something related to human flourishing. As always, if you have any questions, comments, love mail, or hate mail, you can email me at alex at alexepstein.com to get weekly notifications uh, about this show and updates. Subscribe to the newsletter at humanflourishingproject.com and comment on this episode, discuss these issues, share different kinds of feedback on the Facebook page at facebook.com slash humanflourishingproject talk to all of you next week. Until then, I'm Alex Epstein. This has been the Human Flourishing Project.